Coming up on DTNS, why all those privacy pop-ups on your phone are actually working, a solution to nav apps that don't tell you what lane to be in, and Lamar settles the question of whether he should buy or build a gaming PC. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 24th, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. We're drawing also the top tech stories. Oh. Uh, I'm Lamar Wilson, that's okay. <laughs> uh, and I'm Len Peralta, drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. That was well, literally my we're... fault. No, no, we, it's because we're all old. We were just talking about how old we are, how tall we are, uh, movies we're watching. It's all a good day internet. Uh, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS to get that wider conversation. Get to know us a little better. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google announced its next I.O. developer conference will take place on May 12th through May 14th. Users participated in Google's annual I.O. teaser, which this year was a collaborative online game to restore a fictional satellite network. With the final constellation of satellites spelling out the date, I.O. 2020 will be at the Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View, California. No, oh, that's where the Doobie Brothers play. Hey, love them. Sono CEO Patrick Spence published a statement clarifying the company's earlier announcement that it will stop delivering software updates to older products in May. Spence reiterated that all affected products will continue working after May, with Sonos providing bug fixes and security patches as long as possible. He also stated, if we run into something core to the experience that can't be addressed, we'll work to offer an alternative solution and let you know about any changes you'll see in the experience. How nice. Intel announced it earned $1.52 per share in Q4 and revenue of $20.2 billion, up 8% on the year, beating expectations. Uh, people were saying best Intel stuff since the dot-com era. Revenue at Intel's data center group rose 19% on the year to $7.2 billion, thanks to a lot of demand from people in the cloud services industry for those chips. IoT, Mobileye, Intel's memory group, and PC-centric revenues were also all up on the year. The only down spot was Intel's programmable solutions division. That includes the FPGAs. That division fell 17%. Reuters sources say that the U.S. Commerce Department withdrew a rule to further reduce sales to Huawei after the Defense Department cited concerns about the impact on U.S. businesses. The U.S. has restricted trade with Huawei since last May. All right, let's talk a little more uh, about uh, The Verge, who has been on top of the story of third-party content moderators, contract uh, moderators. This time, Lamar, it appears to be about the YouTube moderators. Absolutely. It's the only reason I'm here today. The Verge <laughs> discovered that YouTube content moderators at Accenture are asked to sign a document acknowledging that the job can cause post-traumatic stress disorder. Accenture distributed the document to its workers in its Austin, Texas offices on December 20th, four days after The Verge published an investigation into PTSD among workers at the facility. So the document reads, I understand the content I will be reviewing may be disturbing. It is possible that reviewing such content may or content may have impact my mental health, and it could even lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, otherwise known as PTSD. I will take full advantage of the We Care program and seek additional mental health services if needed. I will tell my supervisor and or PR or HR PR advisor if I believe that the work is negatively affecting my mental health. The Verge points out that under the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, or OSHA, employers are required to provide a workplace that is free of hazards that can cause serious harm or death. Whew. So, whew, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a lot. Wait, weighty topic. Uh, and yeah. and uh, The Verge uh, taking the position in, in its article that uh, perhaps this is Accenture trying to push off responsibility onto the workers or scare them into not uh, seeking remedial action against Accenture for the damage that might be caused to them. And OSHA uh, requires that the employer be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I think you can make an argument both ways. Certainly it's not the employee's responsibility to make the workplace safe a hundred percent. It's it's everybody, including the employer's responsibility to do that. And the employer bears the ultimate responsibility. And and yeah, the law says that it is the company uh, that is on the hook mm -hmm. for any safety violations. On the other hand, putting out this acknowledgement is, is something that Accenture, I think, is doing because they realize it's the right thing to do to make sure that people know how dangerous this kind of moderation might be to their mental health. Now, granted, they're, they seem to be only realizing the need to tell people about that after The Verge pointed it out. That mm -hmm. doesn't make it any less the right thing to do. Where, where I want to go with this conversation is, 
what should a company be doing if it's providing moderation? Whether it's first party, Google, Facebook, or otherwise, or whether it's a company like Accenture that, that provides these kinds of third party contract services for lots of companies in lots of different arenas. If you're dealing with traumatic stuff on the internet, and we all want that traumatic stuff to be looked at and removed if necessary, what are the parameters to make that a safe working place? Is there one? Yeah. I, well, I think there's oh. a couple. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lamar. Okay, this will be quick. Yeah, so let, let's talk about what they do support, right? So they say they're, they're, uh, the employees are given uh, a wellness coach, a hotline to call, and a human resources department. Now, the, again, we got to make sure that that wellness coach is not anybody who's really certified to do that. It's, a, it's just a, a coach. So it's not a medical doctor who's, who can diagnose you properly. So uh, that maybe that's problem number one. It, like, it sounds good on paper, but could that wellness coach just coaches be someone that if they call on the phone and just say hey hang in there we know without actually addressing the, the serious problems so they do well, have they some refer, things they might refer you to yeah. a physician i mean the, these are employees yeah. with health Very insurance true. after all yeah yeah sure. i have a couple problems with this uh and i agree that it is the right thing for a company to be like hey if you're gonna work here there might be some some really bad stuff. It might affect you. It might affect you to the point that you get post-traumatic stress disorder or have severe mental health issues. Here are uh, the resources that we're giving you as a company. Here's you know what we, we hope that you will take advantage of that and let your supervisor know if any of this is happening. That is fine. That is fine on paper. The first problem I have with it, though, is if you're actually experiencing that kind of stress, are you... Are, are you capable of, of utilizing resources that are offered you? I don't know. I have never worked in a position like this, but I would, I, I, I would venture a guess that at some points you don't actually, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of, you're out of whack to the point that just because a wellness coach is available to you, it didn't actually help you and you're not actually better. The second issue I have is this makes sense for a new employee. Absolutely. Like, Hey man, this is, you know, this job might, this job might be tough, not for everybody. You need to know what's going on here. And the person can, you know, has a little bit of a, well, maybe this isn't for me, but if you already work there and all of a sudden now this thing is coming across your desk and you're supposed to sign it saying, yeah, I realize what's going on. I mean, how far into stress have you gotten at that point? And that's kind of where that sort of, you know, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the whole, you know, <laughs> The Verge used the word forcing employees, and I'm not sure that's the right word to use, but but the pressuring an employee to sign something where they they might already be deep into an issue, that it doesn't sit well with me. Yeah, and, they, and I feel that they should have kind of had this talk and signing when you got hired them versus months later. You know, someone should know that they're getting into this and, hey, this might not be the job for you because yeah. let you know right up front. I know some people in our chat room are like, wait a minute, why isn't Google employing these people directly, et cetera? And, and yes, in some cases, that's very true. Sometimes these third party organizations are a little bit fly by night. Accenture is not one of them. Accenture is a, is a, a publicly traded company. It's a huge employer. They provide average benefits. Um, I'm not going to praise them out of the world. I have a friend who works for them. Uh, so this isn't a case where it's offloading it to be super cheap. It's offloading it for expertise and, and liability prevention. And Accenture is good at that kind of liability prevention. Uh, that said, I totally agree. They should have done this before. This is all new territory where we're starting to realize that even though it sounds like an ease, like, like a, a less serious job, content moderation, it shares some of the same dangers as law enforcement or emergency response or, or working in a war zone because of the images you see. And I think that that is the part that people aren't quite getting uh, is that this is a very serious job that you need specific training for and you need specific health care available for. And having a wellness coach is great as long as there's also more serious care available mm -hmm. after that. So the wellness coach can say, this is all you need now or no, your situation is more serious. I'm going to refer you to a physician. So yeah. it's a very complex problem. And some post post job help would be nice. A lot of them will quit. Or get fired and if they nothing. if they have to yeah. leave for yes absolutely yeah. and there were some parts of this acknowledgement that made it sound like hey if this isn't the job for you then there's the door and that's not okay if if you absolutely. took this job and the job makes you incapable of doing it it's the company's responsibility to take care of that yeah. on 
lighter note, yes. a new report from the analyst firm Location Sciences estimates that since the launch of iOS 13, the amount of background location data gathered by marketers dropped by 68%, with foreground location sharing down 24%. This is attributed to the pop-up windows introduced in iOS 13, which allows users to opt into either one-time foreground or background location sharing. Location Sciences CBO Jason Smith predicts that this drop will likely spur more marketers to use IP addresses for location information, which don't indicate a precise location. They can also be masked uh, by things like VPNs. When contacted by a fast company about the report, a Google spokesperson said that when they were presented with the option to share location data, only when actively using an app, Android users select the option about 50% of the time. So those annoying pop-ups work is what this means. Like, Because what's really interesting to this about this to me is iOS has had this option to say only use when I'm active, mm -hmm. only use in the background, never use for a long time. But it was iOS 13 that put it in front of you and forced you to deal with it and started to tell you when it was happening in the background, Do you are you sure you want that? And that made all the difference where people didn't have to think to go hunt for it. Instead, they're like, oh yeah, I don't know. Maybe I don't want that to have access yeah, to think, my location. I think people like information. I, I like the information popping up to let me know, hey, my Bluetooth, and I'm at the Apple store, I may use your Bluetooth data or something, and it's like, or or just some random app. Like, yeah, why, why do they need that? So no, I will turn that off or some location data. So I, I, I think even for Apple users who do like simplicity, the more information, the better. Yeah. And, and and that's that's always been my position on it. I just like I just like to know. Yeah, the 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 annoyance of the pop-ups only they really don't annoy me that much, but just every once in a while it'll be like Fitbit is using your location. Still cool. And I'm like, you've asked me four times. But 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 yes, it is still cool. And I would rather be like mildly annoyed for a millisecond and have more control over what's going on rather than kind of forget what location sharing I, I've shared with a variety of apps that are on my phone that I might not want anymore. And I'll just add that a lot of times we talk about companies putting in a, a fix for something and they don't know if it works or not. They're just doing it for the optics. They're doing it because it looks good. This is a situation where a company did something. I don't know if they knew it would work or not, or if they had any evidence, but it worked. It actually made a difference. And so I think that's worth calling out. Great. GPS-driven navigation instructions are notorious at not preparing you for lane choice. How many times have you got to the right to exit only to find out it's a left exit? Or you choose the right lane to exit only to find out there are three lanes exiting on the right, and the one you need is two over to the left. Google and others have done some things to help you choose your lane, but... Research from MIT might just eliminate the confusion altogether. Scientists at MIT worked with Qatar Computing Research Institute to design a system called Road Tagger that uses neural networks to analyze satellite images. Now, that's not new. Using neural networks to say, oh, that's where the lanes are isn't new, but... Often those satellite images don't show all of the road or all of the lanes because there are trees or buildings or other things in the way. What they did here was use those neural networks to predict what roads and lanes were hidden by trees and buildings and such. The system counted obscured lane numbers with 77% accuracy and road types like highway versus residential with 93% accuracy. The group wants to use Road Tagger to predict other features like bike lanes, parking spots, stuff like that. And the idea is to eventually generate high quality up to date digital maps for any place on the planet without having to send a car around with a camera on top of it because that's expensive. Look, I live in LA. We need this. <laughs> we need this so bad. Uh, I will say in Google Maps, and I believe in Apple Maps too, uh, of the last year, I've no, well, maybe in Apple Maps of the last year, that's what I primarily use. Um, they have said, you know, or shown on, on, on the car, uh, the car app that, hey, there's three lanes here, or they tell you get in the right lane. Now, and so I, I, that information is so invaluable because sometimes I don't know if it's left or right. And, and so, uh, but, but anything more precise, especially in this crazy city, uh, uh, Sarah and Tom can agree. Yeah. It, yes. Well, we need so, it. I mean, yeah, I, I do not disagree with you. I no longer live in Los Angeles, but I did for many years and I did not find GPS to really lead me astray all that often. Now, who knows? Like maybe I'm just the best driver on the planet, but mm -hmm. I doubt that. I found that, you know, with, with the combination of Waze and Google Maps and Apple Maps, you know, I'd used all three depending on kind of, you know, how I was how I was calling up uh, wherever I was going to go. 
for the most part, yeah, it's like, you know, it, it would it would tell me like stay in the right two, second from the right lane of the three lane. Like I, I felt right. like I had a pretty good amount of information and it didn't lead me astray all that often. That said, something that this would work really well for and has burned me a million times is construction, where you're like, oh, I can't go through here. That's not up to date yet. Yeah, because the so lane changes. So anything that's real time would, would mm -hmm. solve the problem of me being like, I, uh, now I'm at, you know, I'm under a freeway. I have to be up there. I can't get around the construction. So, so it, it does, it would, it would come in real handy. Well, and you're right. That is the key aspect of this. Cutter is involved in this because they are hosting the world cup in a couple of years and they are notorious for frequent construction and lane changes and reconfiguring the roads. And that's going to happen a lot around the world cup. So they need this technology by then. Totally. All right, let's talk about London. Uh, London's uh, Metropolitan Police announced that they will begin using live facial recognition cameras from any sea in areas most likely to locate serious offenders. The camera will be used in five to six hour intervals looking for individuals from a list of suspects wanted for serious and violent crimes. Cameras will be signposted with police handing out leaflets on the technology. The Met said that in a, t a 10 test of the cameras, the system was able to identify faces that passed in front of the camera about 70% of the time, with a false positive rate of 1 in 1,000. An independent review of the University of Essex Human Rights Center found that only 8 out of 42 matches were verifiably correct. Mm, different uh, yikes, numbers I'm there. Yeah. 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 Well, a different measurement too, right? Yeah. One one is false sure. positive rate, the other is verifiably correct. That's different ends of the stick there. And, uh, you know, depending on which end of the stick you're measuring, you might uh, <laughs> get a more favorable measurement. Uh, we talked about this a lot on Tuesday's show with Patrick Beja about the idea of whether facial recognition should be banned, what it might be good for, what it might not. Uh, Lamar, how do you feel about this? So, I, I, yeah, I have a, a few points on this I want to cover. The first one is, my understanding, I don't live in London, obviously, but my understanding was, they were already kind of notorious for having cameras everywhere. So um, it would this be something that people would not be, would be shocked about. And, well, and, uh, but the cameras surveilling versus facial recognition, two different things. This is well, one where how it's not know? just you're on tape and they can go back later and look and see if they recognize you. It's an instant tell the police this yeah. person is here. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking, like, how would the average person know that that's happened? But I, I see what you're saying. If they see a camera, they probably are blind to them at this point. Because a Bobby that's... comes up to you with a flyer, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, because hey, not... Yeah, the the oh. whole kind of like you know signposted cameras, so no one you know there's no cameras that are supposedly hidden from the public. I I guess the pessimistic view is well, if somebody's you know on the lam after a violent crime, they're gonna avoid stuff like this. I think that might be the point. Yeah. This, this may be more about making criminals feel like surveillance is out there and, and mm. start to get paranoid about it than it is actually using the facial recognition to catch anybody. Otherwise, yeah, why would you put up so many signs? That, why would you go to the extent of putting out flyers, granted, for, for public outreach and, and try to keep people from being upset because everybody wants to ban facial recognition? But also, you may do it because you, you want to make people feel like, yeah, this is everywhere. You have nowhere to hide. Yeah. Now, now for me, the the match rate is definitely concerning. Uh, you know that yeah. eight, what is it, eight out of forty two, or whatever. But um, it, so it's hope that if they find someone, uh, they do additional checks before busting down their door and start shooting. You know, like like That's like the, I, I would think they're yeah. just another another layer for that. So verifiably that correct. That's where that becomes very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's my issue with it. And 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 to be fair, the London police say they will not be using this to determine something. It's a lead to say, hey, that person you're looking for might be over there. Go check. Yeah. Hopefully that's what they do. So. Yesterday we talked about Google changing some design on paid ads in search. And now the company is changing that newly created presentation of paid search results on the desktop. As we mentioned, Google had changed the paid results to look like regular results, but with a little ad icon in the upper left where a publisher's favicon would otherwise go. In a tweet, uh, Google said, quote, we heard your feedback about the update. We always want to make search better, so we're going to experiment with new placements for favicons. The test will try different placements of the icons, although they don't really say what those different placements might be. I mean, you only have so many choices. Yeah. And, and is it on the left? Is, is on the right? Is it, you know, lower left? <laughs> well, but that this is the interesting thing. This is for desktop. This change already happened on mobile more than a year ago, and nobody minds it, apparently. Uh, and what Google is saying is, we tested this 
on mobile. It was fine. We put it out on mobile. It was fine. We tested it on desktop. Seemed to be fine. We put it out. People are upset. So we're going to try it out in different ways to see if there's a better way to do it. I, But all the ways they said they would do it, like not having the icon at all, I'm like, okay, but what replaces it? I need a few more details there. Sure. Yeah. Like, you know, I was mentioning on the show when we were talking about it yesterday, the color block Well, you know, no designer would be like, that looks great. It does, you know, make it very, very clear. Okay, this is an ad. And then, you know, search results are different from that. That is probably the most obvious option. But assuming that Google's like, well, we're not doing that. So what can they do that is an elegant solution, but also doesn't seem like they're trying to trick anybody? Yeah. And I'm not sure what that answer is. Lamar, what do you think? I, I I actually don't have an answer. I I think the color is a great idea. I I, I think they had that years ago, right? And they they probably yeah, should have kept did. that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, my my only pessimistic idea of this is that how fast they turned around is like, oops, you all don't like this, and I, I feel like they they knew already, and they already had like a plan a plan B. And I, I don't no. know. Just like, yeah. No. <laughs> so they yeah, the never. worst design is going to be the one where the people are like, well, at least they listened. Yeah, you see. see? Yeah. <laughs> They know what they're doing. (laughs) The tail's wagging the dog. All right, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, don't forget you can subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. GDC released its annual survey of developers, and the results are not surprising. 56% of respondents said they were developing their games for PC. That led the way. 39% said they're developing for mobile. 11% for the PS5, 9% for the Xbox, 6% for Stadia, and 3% for Project xCloud from Microsoft. And those are brand new, so that doesn't really surprise me either. It does, however, reflect the reality that PC gaming is still the most widespread, which brings us to the fact that you need a PC for gaming. Lamar, you recently needed to get a new gaming PC. Build, buy, what did you decide? So I decided on uh, buy, Tom, because um, the reason is, ain't nobody got time for that. Like, like, like so, I am so wait, 40. Wait, but but, but I, people may not realize this, you always <laughs> built. I, I I did 15 years. I actually did it as a business back in the 90s, and I, I built computers back then, and I, and I built my own up to 2011 or so. And then I was just like, why am I still doing this? And I, I think Roger mentioned this earlier. The 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 cost ratio has got down so so low that yeah, I could save a few hundred bucks doing it myself. But you know, I do have a few reasons uh, of it. Like the first thing is just time value. If somebody else could do it better. And, and more accurate than I can do uh, and quicker than for me, for my business, it's just more valuable. Uh, I don't mind paying a premium for that. And um, I don't know, this was the, the last one was a little bit more controversial. And I don't, it's no offense to anyone, but I just don't have the ego at my age that I, made, I may have had 20 years ago about it. You know, some people have built their systems. You know, if you don't build your own system, you're not a real gamer. Right. If, just, it was, if it wasn't yeah. harder, you yeah. didn't try hard enough, you don't care. Yeah, it's like, dude, my, my ego's not that fragile. If I if, if it, you know, whoever built it, if I can game on it, then I'm a gamer. And and so that's that's just how I, I view it. I respect the people who built theirs. Don't get me wrong. Uh, some people love doing it. They love getting their hands dirty. Uh, I I do not at 42 anymore. So I'm buying a system, and if I got to pay a premium, I got to pay a premium. That's just how I look at most things in, in life. I need somebody to clean, do deep cleaning. I don't know how to. I'm, I'm not terrible at deep cleaning. I might hire somebody well, to do it. I think that's probably one of the the you know a dissident would say, well, but you could do it so much cheaper if you do it yourself. But time is money, sure. right? And you're saying, that's listen, money. at this point, it's not actually worth it to me, and I'm getting a system that I would have made anyway, and it just kind of gets delivered to me, and I can game all that much sooner. Yep, that's just kind of how, how I feel on it. Uh, Roger, I will add that uh, at least in my own personal experience that. Uh, if you build your own, you're you're pulling components from a d- number of different manufacturers, and depending on who you buy it from, you may or may not get a warranty that covers uh, that particular product. So if something goes and just takes, uh, 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 just craps out on you, you're going to be left holding the bag because now you got to deal with that particular manufacturer. If you buy it from a a, a, a a company, typically they have a warranty that covers everything, so you're not running around trying to chase, you know, after a warranty. And more importantly, um, if you buy something like an Alienware or what used to be Omen from HP, uh, they would still offer out a lot of security updates for their system. Like I, bu- I, I have a gigabyte board in my PC, and the year after I bought it, they came out with the whole Spectre meltdown 
uh you know scare and the specter one was where you actually needed a micro a code patch mm. they stopped supporting my board literally six months after i bought it so anyone who bought that year board which is literally one year away didn't get the patch anyone who bought from six months or uh six months later did get their systems patched so it was very hodgepodge my dell laptop which i bought like four years before the Spectre meltdown was still covered and Dell was still issuing out security patches for it. So from a security perspective, you know, some of the, some of the larger uh, companies that do just sell PCs as a business have a interest in keeping a lot of those security uh, updates still going. So you're saying you, you might get better security update coverage if you yes. bought a machine rather than build it because you're dealing with the company that has a vested interest in keeping it secure versus a part maker, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And 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 honestly, we're don't get us wrong. I don't think any of us are saying don't build. Uh oh, if no. you I'll find it, it fun, if it's a good hobby, if you love the challenge and you love the 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 pursuit and picking the parts and putting it together, you should keep doing it. There's nothing wrong with it. But I think going back to what you were saying, Lamar, the idea that you could save a lot of money that's kind of over. You you may or may not save money and, and it may or may not be worth your time uh, if you're not getting enjoyment out of it. And the the bragging rights of it, I, I, I've i always felt was like, you know, I don't hand code the RSS feed for, for Daily Tech News Show and neither does Roger because <laughs> you know what? That's inefficient. If that's your only reason, like, I don't know that that's, that's such a good reason either. But that said, you know what? If you enjoy building it, that's the best reason to build your own gaming PC because then you you know it well. You know the parts. Uh, you're you're able to fix it yourself easier because you built it. There there are still advantages to it. It just doesn't have those overwhelming advantages that 15, 20 years ago it absolutely did. Yeah, and I just I just think the the whole era of of shaming people for not <laughs> building yeah, their own systems, just whatever. It's just cool. it's just yeah. Some people still do that, and it's just like let you know let that go. It do, it doesn't matter. I didn't build you know? my own car either, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, so shame well, on you. You know what, Tom? Yeah. You don't care enough. Clearly, you don't care enough about the. You're auto not a re- you're not a real I feel driver. Shame driving around in a Toyota that I didn't build yeah. myself. I actually had somebody. This isn't hardware based, but it's you know just <laughs> as an aside before we move on. Somebody the other day, I was mentioning some sort of you know you know way that I've I I I deal with something technical and he was like you know it would be so much easier in the command line and I was like I know it would but instead I bought a software program so <laughs> well sometimes it is sometimes it is it right the other day well, I was I'm I, like I, it is to you I I'm busy <laughs> Doing a show. If, and if, if you know the commands, like I, I just installed homebrew on my Mac the other day uh-huh. and I was like, oh man, it's so cool to be able to just command line install stuff. But that's not true for everything uh, because well, sometimes you're like, you're wait, how it. do I install this? Where do I go? Where do I get the packages? Like it all depends. Every situation is right. different. Exactly. Uh, sometimes command line stories come into our subreddit. All the tech stories that you want to submit and vote on. Dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com is where to send those stories. Let us know what you care about. Also, join in the conversation in our Discord and talk to your fellow DTNS peers about what you care about by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Got some good stuff in the mailbag today. We sure did. So Brad wrote in about our conversation on Wednesday with Scott Johnson. He said, Scott made an offhand plea against facing passenger seating in self-driving cars, meaning kind of like a train where like two would be facing the back and two would be facing the front. Brad says, I'm a huge booster of the idea, though. With restaurant booth-style seating, self-driving cars could do that RV thing. Lower the table, provide a sleeping service. A rider could tuck themselves in on a Friday night and be at Disneyland on Saturday morning. Overnight travel is one of the most exciting concepts of self-driving cars. Hmm. I I want that life. You know, I, I hadn't life. really thought about long distance travel with yeah, autonomous vehicles nice. until Brad, you wrote yeah, in. That's and a good thought. Yeah. I don't want to be sharing this vehicle, which is no, what the concept that we were talking about originally was about. I don't want to yeah. be sleeping next to somebody I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, unless it's, you know, you like a, or like you an know, Uber pool. Yeah. Family members <laughs> or but the, the situation Brad's talking about is pretty cool. I, I do like that. Especially idea. because, I mean, I love a good train, but they're very limited, at least in the U.S. I mean, where can I take a train? Not that many places, but this could this could really open up some 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 travel that that takes longer than what I could do myself. Yeah. Nice. Nice, Brad. Good. Good thinking there. 
Uh, shout out to all our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Jeff Wilkes, Sonia Vining, and Tony Glass. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been busily drawing during our show. What have you drawn for us today, Len? Well, I was most taken with the story that you started with, which was very serious, of course, about mm. uh, YouTube moderators. And the first thing that came to my mind was Clockwork Orange. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen that movie, Stanley Kubrick, uh, but this image is called like comment subscribe hurt uh, wow. and mm -hmm. it depicts a, an image of uh, Malcolm McDowell in that classic uh, scene being handed a PD PTSD waiver uh, while he's watching all these awful things Damn, that are uh, uh, Len this is like an editorial cartoon like this is it really is an editorial yeah, yeah this is cartoon. super detailed super great yeah wow Oh, and that and the sign here thing. It's, yeah, this it's is pretty this awful. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. This is from a it's, movie you said. A, yes, Clockwork okay. Orange. It's okay. uh, Stanley Kubrick's. And actually, that movie, uh, is, this particular scene is about desensitizing people to violence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, this is how they did it in that film. It's really kind of awful to oh. watch, and it sort of reminded me of that. So, uh, if you would like to actually get this print, it's actually available right now at my Patreon, Patreon.com forward slash. Or uh, you can go to my online store, lenperaltastore.com, and just check it out. If you want to purchase it, that would be awesome, too. So, uh, But thank you so much for this uh, for this incredible story. It's uh, really pretty good. heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. thank you so much. Well, thank you, Len, as always. And also, thank you to Lamar Wilson for being with us on this You're fine welcome. Friday. Lamar, what's been going on, and where can people keep up with it? All I've been doing is playing Dragon Ball Z Kakarot the whole week. That is all. That's my whole life. But... <laughs> But if you want to, if you want to look at my uh, actual business life, I'm mostly on uh, YouTube.com/slash Lamar Wilson, where I do tech gaming, uh, even some food fun when I when I feel like doing that, or on uh, my Instagram at uh, Lamar Wilson. Check me out. Thanks. Excellent. Go check it out, folks. Uh, also, don't forget there are benefits to being a member of DTNS. Uh, you get commercial free access to the feed. You get good day internet as an option. Uh, there's a bunch of other things. In fact, if you stick as a member at various levels, we have some six year anniversary merchandise that you can get. Uh, it'll be just automatically shipped to you after your third month at a level. Could be a poster, a mug, a t shirt, a sticker, depends on the level, but it all has the art that Len Peralta created to uh, celebrate our sixth year being complete of Daily Tech News Show. And the way you become a member and get any or all of those benefits is patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you want to join us live, we'd love to have you. Let's all break the fourth wall together. Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you Monday. Bye. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>